The Finest Story in the World by Rudyard Kipling. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tony Addison. The Finest Story in the World by Rudyard Kipling. Oh, ever the nightly years were gone with the old world to the grave. I was a king in Babylon, and you were a Christian slave. W. E. Henley His name was Charlie Mears. He was the only son of his mother who was a widow, and he lived in the north of London, coming into the city every day to work in a bank. He was twenty years old and suffered from aspirations. I met him in a public billiard saloon, where the marker called him by his given name, and he called the marker Bull's Eyes. Charlie explained, a little nervously, that he had only come to the place to look on, and since looking on at games of skill is not a cheap amusement for the young, I suggested that Charlie should go back to his mother. That was our first step toward better acquaintance. He would call on me sometimes in the evening, instead of running about London with his fellow clerks, and before long, speaking of himself as a young man must, he told me of his aspirations, which were all literary. He desired to make himself an undying name, chiefly through verse, though he was not above sending stories of love and death to the dropper penny in the slot journals. It was my fate to sit still while Charlie read me poems of many hundred lines and bulky fragments of plays that would surely shake the world. My reward was his unreserved confidence, and the self-revelations and troubles of a young man are almost as holy as those of a maiden. Charlie had never fallen in love, but was anxious to do so on the first opportunity. He believed in all things good and all things honourable, but at the same time was curiously careful to let me see that he knew his way about the world, as befitted a bank clerk on twenty-five shillings a week. He rhymed dove with love, and moon with June, and devoutly believed that they had never so been rhymed before. For long lame gaps in his plays he filled up with hasty words of apology and description and swept on, seeing all that he intended to do so clearly that he esteemed it already done and turned to me for applause. I fancy that his mother did not encourage his aspirations, and I know that his writing-table at home was the edge of his washstand. This he told me almost at the outset of our acquaintance, when he was ravaging my bookshelves, and a little before I was implored to speak the truth as to his chances of writing something really great, you know. Maybe I encouraged him too much, for one night he called on me, his eyes flaming with excitement, and said, breathlessly, Do you mind? Can you let me stay here and write all this evening? I won't interrupt you. I won't, really. There's no place for me to write in at my mother's. What's the trouble? I said, knowing well what the trouble was. I've a notion in my head that would make the most splendid story that was ever written. Do let me write that here. It's such a notion. There was no resisting the appeal. I set him a table. He hardly thanked me, but plunged into the work at once. For half an hour the pen scratched without stopping. Then Charlie sighed and tugged his hair. The scratching grew slower. There were more erasures, and at last ceased. The finest story in the world would not come forth. It looks such awful rot now, 
he said mournfully. And yet it seemed so good when I was thinking about it. What's wrong? I could not dishearten him by saying the truth, so I answered, Perhaps you don't feel in the mood for writing. Yes, I do, except when I look at this stuff. Ugh! Read me what you've done, I said. He read, and it was wondrous bad, and he paused at all the specially turgid sentences, expecting a little approval, for he was proud of those sentences, as I knew he would be. It needs compression, I suggested cautiously. I hate cutting my things down. I don't think you could alter a word here without spoiling the sense. It reads better aloud than when I was writing it. Charlie, you're suffering from an alarming disease afflicting a numerous class. I'll put the thing by and tackle it again in a week. I want to do it at once. What do you think of it? How can I judge from a half-written tale? Tell me the story as it lies in your head. Charlie told, and in the telling there was everything that his ignorance had so carefully prevented from escaping into the written word. I looked at him, and wondering whether it were possible that he did not know the originality, the power of the notion that had come in his way. It was distinctly a notion among notions. Men had been puffed up with pride by notions not a tithe as excellent and practicable. But Charlie babbled on serenely, interrupting the current of pure fancy with samples of horrible sentences that he purposed to use. I heard him out to the end. It would be folly to allow his idea to remain in his own inept hands when I could do so much with it. Not all that could be done indeed, but oh, so much! "'What do you think?' he said at last. "'I fancy I shall call it the story of a ship.' "'I think the idea is pretty good, "'but you won't be able to handle it for ever so long. "'Now I... "'Would it be of any use to you? "'Would you care to take it? "'I should be proud,' said Charlie promptly. "'There are few things sweeter in this world "'than the guileless, hot-headed, "'intemperate, open admiration of a junior.' Even a woman in her blindest devotion does not fall into the gate of the man she adores, tilt her bonnet to the angle at which he wears his hat, or interlard her speech with his pet oaths. And Charlie did all these things. Still, it was necessary to salve my conscience before I possessed myself of Charlie's thoughts. "'Let's make a bargain. I'll give you a fiver for the notion,' I said." Charlie became a bank clerk at once. Oh, that's impossible. Between two pals, you know, if I may call you so, and speaking as a man of the world, I couldn't. Oh, take the notion if it's any use to you. I've heaps more. He had. None knew this better than I. But they were the notions of other men. Look at it as a matter of business. Between men of the world, I returned. Five pounds will buy you any number of poetry books. Business is business, and you may be sure I shouldn't give that price unless— Oh, if you put it that way, said Charlie, visibly moved by the thought of the books. The bargain was clenched with an agreement that he should, at unstated intervals, come to me with all the notions that he possessed, should have a table of his own to write at, and unquestioned right to inflict upon me all his poems and fragments of poems. Then I said, Now, tell me how you came by this idea. It came by itself. Charlie's eyes opened a little. Yes, but you told me a great deal about the hero that you must have read before somewhere. I haven't any time for reading, except when you let me sit here and on Sundays I'm on my bicycle or down the river all day. There's nothing wrong about the hero, is there? Tell me again, and I shall understand clearly. You say that your hero went pirating. How did he live? He was on the lower deck of the ship thing that I was telling you about. What sort of ship? It was the kind rowed with oars. 
and the sea spurts through the oar holes and the men row sitting up to their knees in water then there's a bench running down between the two lines of oars and an overseer with a whip walks up and down the bench to make the men work how do you know that it's in the tail there's a rope running overhead looped to the upper deck for the overseer to catch hold of when the ship rolls when the overseer misses the rope once and falls among the rowers remember the hero laughs at him and gets licked for it he's chained to his oar of course the hero how is he chained with an iron band round his waist fixed to the bench he sits on and a sort of handcuff on his left wrist chaining him to the oar he's on the lower deck where the worst men are sent and the only light comes from the hatchways and through the oar holes can't you imagine the sunlight just squeezing through between the handle and the hole and wobbling about as the ship moves i can but i can't imagine your imagining it how could it be any other way now you listen to me the long oars on the upper deck are managed by four men to each bench the lower ones by three and the lowest of all by two remember it's quite dark on the lowest deck and all the men there go mad when a man dies at his oar on that deck he isn't thrown overboard but cut up in his chains and stuffed through the oar hole in little pieces why i demanded amazed not so much at the information as the tone of command in which it was flung out to save trouble and to frighten the others it needs two overseers to drag a man's body up to the top deck and if the men at the lower deck oars were left alone of course they'd stop rowing and try to pull up the benches by all standing up together in their chains you a most provident imagination where have you been reading about galleys and galley slaves nowhere that i remember i row a little when i get the chance but perhaps if you say so i may have read something he went away shortly afterward to deal with booksellers and i wondered how a bank clerk aged twenty could put into my hands with a profligate abundance of detail all given with absolute assurance the story of extravagant and bloodthirsty adventure riot piracy and death in unnamed seas he had led his hero a desperate dance through revolt against the overseers to command of a ship of his own and ultimate establishment of a kingdom on an island somewhere in the sea you know and delighted with my paltry five pounds had gone out to buy the notions of other men that these might teach him how to write i had the consolation of knowing that this notion was mine by right of purchase and i thought that i could make something of it when next he came to me he was drunk royally drunk on many poets for the first time revealed to him his pupils were dilated his words tumbled over each other and he wrapped himself in quotations most of all was he drunk with longfellow isn't it splendid isn't it superb he cried after hasty greetings oh, listen to this wouldst thou so the helmsman answered know the secret of the sea only those who brave its dangers comprehend its mystery by gum only those who brave its dangers comprehend its mystery he repeated twenty times walking up and down the room and forgetting me but i can understand it too he said to himself i don't know how to thank you for that fibre and this listen i remember the black wharves and the ships and the sea tides tossing free and the spanish sailors with bearded lips and the beauty and mystery of the ships and the magic of the sea i haven't braved any dangers but i feel as if i knew all about it you certainly seem to have a grip of the sea have you ever seen it when i was a little chap i went to brighton once we used to live in coventry though before we came to london i never saw it when descends on the atlantic the gigantic storm wind of the equinox he shook me by the shoulder to make me understand the passion that was shaking himself when that storm comes he continued i think that all the oars in the ship that i was talking about get broken and the rowers have their chests smashed in by the bucking oarheads oh by the way 
have you done anything with that notion of mine yet no i was waiting to hear more of it from you tell me how in the world you are so certain about the fittings of the ship you know nothing of ships i don't know it's as real as anything to me until i try to write it down i was thinking about it only last night in bed after you had thrown me treasure island and i made up a whole lot of new things to go into the story what sort of things about the food the men ate rotten figs and black beans and wine in a skin bag passed from bench to bench was the ship built so long ago as that as what i don't know whether it was long ago or not it's only a notion but sometimes it seems just as real as if it was true do i bother you with talking about it not in the least did you make up anything else oh yes but it's nonsense charlie flushed a little never mind let's hear about it well i was thinking over the story and after a while i got out of bed and wrote down on a piece of paper the sort of stuff the men might be supposed to scratch on their oars with the edges of their handcuffs it seemed to make the thing more lifelike it is so real to me you know have you the paper on you y yes but what's the use of showing it it's only a lot of scratches all the same we might have them reproduced in the book on the front page i'll attend to those details show me what your men wrote he pulled out of his pocket a sheet of note-paper with a single line of scratches upon it and i put this carefully away what is it supposed to mean in english i said oh i don't know perhaps it means i'm beastly tired it's great nonsense he repeated but all those men in the ship seem as real people to me oh do do something to the notion soon i should like to see it written and printed but all you told me would make a long book well make it then you've only to sit down and write it out give me a little time have you any more notions not just now i'm reading all the books i've bought they're splendid when he had left i looked at the sheet of note-paper with the inscription upon it then i took my head tenderly between both hands to make certain that it was not coming off or turning round then but there seemed to be no interval between quitting my rooms and finding myself arguing with a policeman outside a door marked private in a corridor of the british museum all i demanded as politely as possible was the greek antiquity man the policeman knew nothing except the rules of the museum and it became necessary to forage through all the houses and offices inside the gates an elderly gentleman called away from his lunch put an end to my search by holding the note-paper between finger and thumb and snipping at it scornfully what does this mean hmm said he so far as i can ascertain it is an attempt to write extremely corrupt greek on the part here he glared at me with intention of an extremely illiterate <laughs> person he read slowly from the paper a pollock Erkman, Tauschnitz, Henneker, four names familiar to me. Can you tell me what the corruption is supposed to mean, the gist of the thing, I asked? I have been many times overcome with weariness in this particular employment. That is the meaning. He returned me the paper, and I fled without a word of thanks, explanation, or apology. I might have been excused for forgetting much. To me, of all men, had been given the chance to write the most marvellous tale in the world, nothing less than the story of a Greek galley-slave, as told by himself. Small wonder that his dreaming had seemed real to Charlie. The fates that are so careful to shut the doors of each successive life behind us had, in this case, been neglectful, and Charlie was looking though that he did not know when never man had been permitted to look with full knowledge since time began above all he was absolutely ignorant of the knowledge sold to me for five pounds 
and he would retain that ignorance, for bank clerks do not understand metempsychosis, and a sound commercial education does not include Greek. He would supply me. Here I capered among the dumb gods of Egypt, and laughed in their battered faces, with material to make my tale sure, so sure that the world would hail it as an impudent and vamped fiction, and I, I alone, would know that it was absolutely and literally true. I, I alone, held this jewel to my hand for the cutting and polishing. Therefore I danced again among the gods, till a policeman saw me, and took steps in my direction. It remained now only to encourage Charlie to talk, and here there was no difficulty. But I had forgotten those accursed books of poetry. He came to me time after time, as useless as a surcharged phonograph, drunk on Byron, Shelley, or Keats. Knowing now what the boy had been in his past lives, and desperately anxious not to lose one word of his babble, I could not hide from him my respect and interest. He misconstrued both into respect for the present soul of Charlie Mears, to whom life was as new as it was to Adam, and interest in his readings, and stretched my patience to breaking point by reciting poetry, not his own now, but that of others. I wished every English poet blotted out of the memory of mankind. I blasphemed the mightiest names of song, because they had drawn Charlie from the path of direct narrative, and would, later, spur him to imitate them. But I choked down my impatience, until the first flood of enthusiasm should have spent itself, and the boy returned to his dreams. "'What's the use of my telling you what I think, oh, when these chaps wrote things for the angels to read?' he growled one evening. "'Why don't you write something like theirs?' "'I don't think you're treating me quite fairly,' I said, speaking under strong restraint. "'I've given you the story,' he said, shortly replunging into Lara. "'But I want the details. "'The things I make up about that damn shit that you call a galley, they're quite easy. "'You can just make them up yourself. "'Turn up the gas a little. I want to go on reading.' "'I could have broken the gas globe over his head for his amazing stupidity.' I could indeed make up things for myself did I only know what Charlie did not know that he knew. But since the doors were shut behind me, I could only wait his youthful pleasure and strive to keep him in good temper. One minute's want of guard might spoil a priceless revelation. Now and again he would toss his books aside. He kept them in my rooms, for his mother would have been shocked at the waste of good money had she seen them and launched into his sea-dreams. Again I cursed all the poets of England. The plastic mind of the bank clerk had been overlaid, coloured, and distorted by that which he had read, and the result, as delivered, was a confused tangle of other voices, most like the muttered song through a city telephone in the busiest part of the day. He talked of the galley, his own galley, had he but known it, with illustrations borrowed from the bride of abydos he pointed the experiences of his hero with quotations from the corsair and threw in deep and desperate moral reflections from cain and manfred expecting me to use them all only when the talk turned on longfellow with a jarring cross-currents dumb and I knew that Charlie was speaking the truth as he remembered it. "'What do you think of this?' I said one evening, as soon as I understood the medium in which his memory worked best, and before he could expostulate, read him the whole of the saga of King Olaf. He listened open-mouthed, flushed his hands drumming on the back of the sofa where he lay, till I came to the songs of Amar Tamberskalva, and the verse, Amar then, the arrow taking, from the loosened string, answered, That was Norway breaking, neath thy hand, O king. He gasped with pure delight of sound. 
that's better than byron a little i ventured better why it's true how could he have known i went back and repeated what was that said olaf standing on the quarter-deck something heard i like the stranding of a shattered wreck how could he have known how the ships crash and the oars rip out and go zip all along the line why only the other night oh but go back please and read the scurry of shrieks again no i'm tired let's talk what happened the other night i had an awful nightmare about that galley of ours i dreamed i was drowned in a fight you see we ran alongside another ship in harbour the water was dead still except where our oars whipped it up you know where i always sit in the galley he spoke haltingly at first under a fine english fear of being laughed at no that's news to me i answered meekly my heart beginning to beat on the fourth oar from the bow on the right side on the upper deck there were four of us at the oar all chained i remember watching the water and trying to get my handcuffs off before the row began then we closed up on the other ship and all their fighting men jumped over our bullocks and my bench broke and i was pinned down with the three other fellows on top of me and the big oar jammed across our backs well charlie's eyes were alive and alight he was looking at the wall behind my chair i don't know how we fought the men were trampling all over my back and i lay low then our rowers on the left side tied to their oars you know began to yell and backwater i could hear the water sizzle and we spun round like a cup chafer and i knew lying where i was that there was a galley coming up bow on to ram us on the left side i could just lift up my head and see us sail over the bullocks we wanted to meet her bow to bow but it was too late we could only turn a little bit because the galley on our right had hooked herself on to us and stopped our moving then by gum there was a crash our left doors began to break as the other galley the moving one you know stuck her nose into them then the lower deck oars shot up through the deck planking but first and one of them jumped clean up into the air and came down again close to my head how was that managed the moving galley's bow was plunking them back through their own oar holes and i could hear the devil of a shindy in the decks below then her nose caught us nearly in the middle and we tilted sideways and the fellows in the right-hand galley unhitched their hooks and ropes and threw things on to our upper deck arrows and hot pitch or something that stung and we went up and up and up on the left side and the right side dipped and i twisted my head round and saw the water stand still as it topped the right bullocks and then it curled over and crashed down on the whole lot of us on the right side and i felt it hit my back and i woke one minute charlie when the sea topped the bullocks what did it look like i had my reasons for asking a man of my acquaintance had once gone down with a leaking ship in a still sea and had seen the water level pause for an instant ere it fell on the deck it looked just like a banjo string drawn tight and it seemed to stay there for years said charlie exactly the other man had said it looked like a silver wire laid down along the bullocks and i thought it was never going to break he had paid everything except the bare life for this little valueless piece of knowledge and i had travelled ten thousand weary miles to meet him and take his knowledge at second hand but charlie the bank clerk on twenty-five shillings a week he who had never been out of sight of a london omnibus knew it all it was no consolation to me that once in his lives he had been forced to die for his gains i also must have died scores of times but behind me because i could have used my knowledge the doors were shut and then i said trying to put away the devil of envy the funny thing was though in all the mess i didn't feel a bit astonished or frightened it seemed as if i'd been in a good many fights because i told my next man so when the row began but that cad of an overseer on my deck wouldn't unloose our chains and give us a chance 
He always said that we'd all be set free after a battle, but we never were. We never were. Charlie shook his head mournfully. What a scoundrel! I should say he was. He never gave us enough to eat, and sometimes we were so thirsty that we used to drink salt water. I can taste that salt water still. Now, tell me something about the harbour where the fight was fought. I didn't dream about that. I know it was a harbour, though, because we were tied up to a ring on a white wall, and all the face of the stone under water was covered with wood to prevent our ram getting chipped when the tide made us rock. That's curious. Our hero commanded the galley, didn't he? Didn't he just? He stood by the bows and shouted like a good'un. He was the man who killed the overseer. But you were all drowned together, Charlie, weren't you? I can't make that fit quite, he said with a puzzled look. The galley must have gone down with all hands, and yet I fancy that the hero went on living afterward. Perhaps he climbed into the attacking ship. I wouldn't see that, of course. I was dead, you know. He shivered slightly, and protested that he could remember no more. I did not press him further, but to satisfy myself that he lay in ignorance of the workings of his own mind, deliberately introduced him to Mortimer Collins' transmigration, and gave him a sketch of the plot before he opened the pages. "'What rot it all is,' he said frankly at the end of an hour. "'I don't understand his nonsense about the red planet Mars and the king and the rest of it. Chuck me the long fellow again.' I handed him the book, and wrote out as much as I could remember of his description of the sea-fight, appealing to him from time to time for confirmation of fact or detail. He would answer without raising his eyes from the book, as assuredly as though all his knowledge lay before him on the printed page. I spoke under the normal key of my voice, that the current might not be broken, and I know that he was not aware of what he was saying, for his thoughts were out on the sea with Longfellow. Charlie, I asked, when the rowers on the galleys mutinied, how did they kill their overseers? Tore up the benches and brained them. That happened when a heavy sea was running. An overseer on the lower deck slipped from the centre plank and fell among the rowers. They choked him to death against the side of the ship with their chained hands quite quietly, and it was too dark for the other overseer to see what had happened. When he asked, he was pulled down too and choked, and the lower deck fought their way up, deck by deck, with the pieces of the broken benches banging behind him. <laughs> How they howled! And what happened after that? I don't know. The hero went away, red hair and red beard and all. That was after he had captured our galley, I think. The sound of my voice irritated him, and he motioned slightly with his left hand as a man does when interruption jars. You never told me he was red-headed before, or that he captured your galley, I said, after a discreet interval. Charlie did not raise his eyes. He was as red as a red bear, said he abstractedly. He came from the north. They said so in the galley, when he looked for rowers, not slaves, but free men. Afterward, years and years afterward, news came from another ship, or else he came back. His lips moved in silence. He was rapturously retasting some poem before him. Where had he been then? I was almost whispering that the sentence might come gentle to whichever section of Charlie's brain was working on my behalf. To the beaches! The long and wonderful beaches! was the reply after a minute of silence. To Fudorstrandi, I asked tingling from head to foot. Yes, to Fadurthandai. He pronounced the word in a new fashion. And I too saw. So. The voice failed. Do you know what you have said? I shouted incautiously. He lifted his eyes, fully roused. Now, no, he snapped. I wish you'd let a chap go on reading. Heart to this. But Othera, the old sea captain, he neither paused nor stirred till the king listened, and then once more took up his pen and wrote down every word. And to the king of the Saxons, in witness of the truth, raising his noble head, 
he stretched his brown hand and said, Behold, this walrus tooth! By Jove, what chaps those must have been to go sailing all over the shop, never knowing where they'd fetch the land! <laughs> Charlie, I pleaded, if you'll only be sensible for a minute or two, I'll make our hero in our tale every inch as good as author. Hmm. <laughs> Longfellow wrote that poem. I don't care about writing things any more. I want to read. He was thoroughly out of tune now, and raging over my own ill luck I left him. Conceive yourself at the door of the world's treasure house, guarded by a child, an idle, irresponsible child, playing knucklebones, on whose favour depends the gift of the key, and you will imagine one half my torment. Till that evening Charlie had spoken nothing that might not lie within the experiences of a Greek galley-slave. But now, or there was no virtue in books, he had talked of some desperate adventure of the Vikings, of Thorfinn Karlsefner's sailing to Wineland, which is America, in the ninth or tenth century, the battle in the harbour he had seen, and his own death he had described. But this was a much more startling plunge into the past, was it possible that he had skipped half a dozen lives, and was then dimly remembering some episode of a thousand years later? It was a maddening jumble, and the worst of it was that Charlie Mears, in his normal condition, was the last person in the world to clear it up. I could only wait and watch, but I went to bed that night full of the wildest imaginings. There was nothing that was not possible, if Charlie's detestable memory only held good. I might rewrite the saga of Thorfinn Karlsefne, as it had never been written before. Might tell the story of the first discovery of America, myself the discoverer. But I was entirely at Charlie's mercy, and so long as there was a three-and-six-funny bone volume within his reach, Charlie would not tell. I dared not curse him openly. I hardly dared jog his memory for I was dealing with the experiences of a thousand years ago, told through the mouth of a boy of today, and a boy of today is affected by every change of tone and gust of opinion, so that he lies, even when he desires to speak the truth. I saw no more of him for nearly a week. When next I met him, it was in Gracechurch Street, with a bill-book chained to his waist. Business took him over London Bridge, and I accompanied him, he was very full of the importance of that book and magnified it. As we passed over the Thames, we paused to look at a steamer unloading great slabs of white and brown marble. A barge drifted under the steamer's stern, and a lonely cow in that barge bellowed. Charlie's face changed from the face of the bank clerk to that of an unknown, and, though he would not have believed this, a much shrewder man. He flung out his arm across the parapet of the bridge, and laughing very loudly said, When they heard our bulls bellow, the screelings ran away. I waited only for an instant, but the barge and the cow had disappeared under the bows of the steamer before I answered, Charlie, what do you suppose are screelings? Never heard of them before. They sound like a new kind of seagull. "'What a chap you are for asking questions,' he replied. "'I have to go to the cashier of the omnibus company yonder. "'Will you wait for me and we can lunch somewhere together? "'I've a notion for a poem.' "'No, thanks, I'm off. "'You're sure you know nothing about Screelings?' "'Not unless he's been entered for the Liverpool handicap.' "'He nodded and disappeared in the crowd. "'Now it is written in the saga of Eric the Red, "'or that of Thorfinn Karlsfrina that nine hundred years ago, when Karl Spner's galleys came to Leif's booths, which Leif had erected in the unknown land called Markland, which may or may not have been Rhode Island, the Screelings, and the Lord he knows who these may or may not have been, came to trade with the Vikings and ran away, because they were frightened at the bellowing of the cattle which Thorfinn had brought with him in the ship. But what in the world could a Greek slave know of that affair? I wandered up and down among the streets, trying to unravel the mystery, 
and the more I considered it, the more baffling it grew. One thing only seemed certain, and that certainty took away my breath for the moment. If I came to full knowledge of anything at all, it would not be one life of the soul in Charlie Mears's body, but half a dozen, half a dozen several and separate existences spent on blue water in the morning of the world. Then I walked round the situation. Obviously, if I used my knowledge, I should stand alone and unapproachable until all men were as wise as myself. That would be something, but manlike, I was ungrateful. It seemed bitterly unfair that Charlie's memory should fail me when I needed it most. Great powers above! I looked up at them through the fog smoke. Did the lords of life and death know what this meant to me? Nothing less than eternal fame of the best kind that comes from one and is shared by one alone. I would be content, remembering Clive, I stood astounded at my own moderation, with the mere right to tell one story, to work out one little contribution to the light literature of the day. If Charlie were permitted full recollection for one hour, for sixty short minutes, of existences that had extended over a thousand years, I would forego all profit and honour from all that I should make of his speech. I would take no share in the commotion that would follow throughout the particular corner of the earth that calls itself the world. The thing should be put forth anonymously, nay, I would make other men believe that they had written it. They would hire bull-hided self-advertising Englishmen to bellow it abroad. Preachers would found a fresh conduct of life upon it, swearing that it was new, and that they had lifted the fear of death from all mankind. Every Orientalist in Europe would patronise it discursively with Sanskrit and Pali texts. Terrible women would invent unclean variants of the men's belief for the elevation of their sisters. Churches and religions would war over it. Between the hailing and restarting of an omnibus, I foresaw the scuffles that would arise among half a dozen denominations, all professing the doctrine of the true metempsychosis as applied to the world and the new era, and saw, too, the respectable English newspapers shying like frightened kine over the beautiful simplicity of the tale. The mind leaped forward a hundred, two hundred, a thousand years. I saw with sorrow that men would mutilate and garble the story, that rival creeds would turn it upside down till at last the western world, which clings to the dread of death more closely than the hope of life, would set it aside as an interesting superstition and stampede after some fate so long forgotten that it seemed altogether new. Upon this I changed the terms of the bargain that I would make with the lords of life and death. Only let me know, let me write the story with sure knowledge that I wrote the truth, and I would burn the manuscript as a solemn sacrifice. Five minutes after the last line was written I would destroy it all, but I must be allowed to write it with absolute certainty. There was no answer. The flaming colours of an aquarium poster caught my eye, and I wondered whether it would be wise or prudent to lure Charlie into the hands of the professional mesmerist, and whether, if he were under his power, he would speak of his past lives. If he did, and if people believed him, but Charlie would be frightened and flustered, or made conceited by the interviews. In either case, he would begin to lie, through fear or vanity. He was safest in my hands. They are very funny fools, your English, said a voice at my elbow, and turning round, I recognised a casual acquaintance, a young Bengali law student, called Grish Chunder, whose father had sent him to England to become civilised. The old man was a retired native official, and on an income of five pounds a month, 
contrived to allow his son two hundred pounds a year, and the run of his teeth in a city where he could pretend to be the cadet of a royal house, and tell stories of the brutal Indian bureaucrats who ground the faces of the poor. Grish Chunda was a young, fat, full-bodied Bengali, dressed with scrupulous care, in frock-coat, tall hat, light trousers, and tan gloves. But I had known him in the days when the brutal Indian government paid for his university education, and he contributed cheap sedition to Saki Durpan, and intrigued with the wives of his schoolmates. That is very funny and very foolish, he said, nodding at the poster. I am going down to the Northbrook Club. Will you come too? I walked with him for some time. You are not well, he said. What is there in your mind? You do not talk. Grishchander, you've been too well educated to believe in a god, haven't you? Oh, yes, here. But when I go home, I must conciliate popular superstition and make ceremonies of purification, and my women will anoint idols and bang up Tulsi, and feast the Porohit, and take you back into caste again, and make a good kutarj of you again, you advanced social free-thinker. And you'll eat desi food, and like it all, from the smell in the courtyard to the mustard oil over you. I shall very much like it, said Grish Chunda unguardedly. Once a Hindu, always a Hindu but I like to know what the English think they know. I'll tell you something that one Englishman knows. It's an old tale to you. I began to tell the story of Charlie in English, but Grish Chunder put a question in the vernacular, and the history went forward naturally in the tongue best suited for its telling. After all, it could never have been told in English. Grish Chunder heard me, nodding from time to time, and then came up to my rooms, where I finished the tale. Beshak, he said philosophically, Lekin Darwaza, band high, without doubt, but the door is shut. I have heard of this remembering of previous existences among my people. It is, of course, an old tale with us, but to happen to an Englishman, a cow fed marsh. An outcast, by Jove, that is most peculiar. Outcast yourself, Grish Chunder. You eat cow beef every day. Let's think the thing over. The boy remembers his incarnations. Does he know that? said Grish Chunder quietly, swinging his legs as he sat on my table. He was speaking in English now. He does not know anything. Would I speak to you if he did? Go on. There is no going on at all. If you tell that to your friends, they will say you are mad and put it in the papers. Suppose now you prosecute for libel. Let's leave that out of the question entirely. Is there any chance of his being made to speak? Oh, there is a chance. Oh, yes. But if he spoke, it would mean that all this world would end now. Instanto, fall down on your head. These things are not allowed, you know. As I said, the door is shut. Not a ghost of a chance. How can there be? You are a Christian, and it is forbidden to eat in your books of the tree of life, or else you would never die. How shall you all fear death, if you all know what your friend does not know that he knows? I am afraid to be kicked, but I am not afraid to die, because I know what I know. You are not afraid to be kicked, but you are afraid to die, if you are not by God. You English will be all over the shop in an hour, upsetting the balances of power and making commotions. It would not be good, but no fear. He will remember a little and a little less, and he will call it dreams. Then he will forget altogether. When I passed my first arts examination in Calcutta, that was all in the cram book on Wordsworth. Trailing clouds of glory, you know. This seems to be an exception to the rule. There are no exceptions to rules. Some are not so hard-looking as others, but they are all the same when you touch. If this friend of yours said so-and-so, and so-and-so, -so, indicating that he remembered all his lost lives, or one piece of a lost life, 
he would not be in the bank another hour. He would be what you called sacked, because he was mad, and they would send him to an asylum for lunatic. You can see that, my friend. Of course I can, but I wasn't thinking of him. His name need never appear in the story. Ah, I see. That story will never be written. You can try. I am going to. For your own credit, and for the sake of money, of course. No, for the sake of writing the story. On my honour, that will be all. Even then, there is no chance. You cannot play with the gods. It is a very pretty story now, as they say. Let it go on that. I mean, at that. Be quick. He will not last long. How do you mean? What I say. He has never so far thought about a woman. Hasn't he, though? I remembered some of Charlie's confidences. I mean, no woman has thought about him. When that comes, puss, hog, yeah, all up. I know, there are millions of women here, housemaids, for instance. I winced at the thought of my story being ruined by a housemaid, and yet nothing was more probable. Grish Chunder grinned. Yes, also pretty girls, cousins of his house, and perhaps not of his house. One kiss that he gives back again, and remembers will cure all this nonsense, or else... Or else what? Remember, he does not know that he knows. I know that. Or else, if nothing happens, he will become immersed in the trade, and the financial speculations like the rest. It must be so. You can see that it must be so. But the woman will come first, I think. There was a rap at the door, and Charlie charged in impetuously. He had been released from office, and by the look in his eyes, I could see that he had come over for a long talk, most probably with poems in his pockets. Charlie's poems were very wearying, but sometimes they led him to talk about the galley. Grish Chunder looked at him keenly for a minute. I beg your pardon? Charlie said uneasily. I didn't know you had anyone with you. I am going, said Grish Chunder. He drew me into the lobby as he departed. That is your man, he said quickly. I tell you, he will never speak all you wish. That is Ratbosh. But he will be most good to make to see things. Suppose now we pretend that it was only play. I had never seen Grish Chunder so excited. And pour the ink pool into his hand. Eh, hey, what do you think? I tell you that he could see anything that a man could see. Let me get the ink and the comfort. He is a seer, and he will tell us very many things. He may be all, you say, but I am not going to trust him to your gods and devils. It will not hurt him. He will only feel a little stupid and dull when he wakes up. You have seen boys look into the ink pool before. That is the reason why I am not going to see it any more. You had better go, Grishchunder. He went declaring far down the staircase that it was throwing away my only chance of looking into the future. This left me unmoved, for I was concerned for the past, and no peering of hypnotised boys into mirrors and ink pools would help me do that. But I recognised Grish Chunder's point of view, and sympathised with it. "'What a big black brute that was!' said Charlie, when I returned to him. "'Well, look here. I've just done a poem.' Did it instead of playing dominoes after lunch. May I read it? Let me read it to myself. Then you miss the proper expression. Besides, you always make my things sound as if the rhymes were all wrong. Read it aloud, then. You're like the rest of them. Charlie mouthed me his poem, and it was not much worse than the average of his verses. He had been reading his book faithfully, but he was not pleased when I told him that I preferred my Longfellow undiluted with Charlie. Then we began to go through the manuscript line by line, Charlie parrying every objection and correction with, Yes, that may be better, but you don't catch what I'm driving at. Charlie was, in one way at least, a very like one kind of poet. There was a pencil scrawl at the back of the paper, and what's that, I said? Oh, that's not poetry at all. It's some rot I wrote last night before I went to bed, and it was too much bother to hunt for rhymes, so I made it a sort of a blank verse instead. Here is Charlie's blank verse. 
We pulled for you when the wind was against us and the sails were low. Will you never let us go? We had bread and onions when you took towns, or ran aboard quickly when you were beaten back by the foe. The captains walked up and down the deck in fair weather singing songs, but we were below. We fainted with our chins on the oars, and you did not see that we were idle, for we still swung to and fro. Will you never let us go? The salt made the oar handles like shark skin. Our knees were cut to the bone with salt cracks. Our hair was stuck to our foreheads, and our lips were cut to our gums, and you whipped us because we could not row. Will you never let us go? But in a little time we shall run out of the portholes as the water runs along the oar blade, and though you tell the others to row after us, you will never catch us till you catch the oar thrush and tie up the winds in the belly of the sail. Oh, will you never let us go? Hmm. What's oar thrush, Charlie? The water washed up by the oars. That's the sort of song they might sing in the galley, you know. Aren't you ever going to finish that story and give me some of the profits? It depends on yourself. If you had only told me more about your hero in the first instance, it might have been finished by now. You're so hazy in your notions. I only want to give you the general notion of it. The knocking about from place to place and the fighting and all that. Can't you pull in the rest yourself? Make the hero save a girl on a pirate galley and marry her or do something. You're a really helpful collaborator. I suppose the hero went through some few adventures before we married. Well, then make him a very artful card a low sort of man a sort of political man who went about making treaties and breaking them a black-haired chap who hid behind the mast when the fighting began but you said the other day that he was red-haired i couldn't have make him black-haired of course you've no imagination seeing that i had just discovered the entire principles on which the half memory falsely called imagination is based i felt entitled to laugh but forbore for the sake of the tale. You're right. You're the man with imagination. A black-haired chap in a deck ship, I said. No, an open ship, like a big boat. This was maddening. Your ship has been built and designed, closed and decked in. You said so yourself, I protested. No, no, not that ship. That was open or half-decked because... Oh, by Jove, you're right. You made me think of the hero as a red-haired chap. Of course, if you were red, the ship would be an open one with painted sails. Surely, I thought, he would remember now that he had served in two galleys at least, in a three-deck Greek one under the black-haired political man, and again in a Viking's open sea serpent under the man red as a red bear who went to Markland. The devil prompted me to speak. Why, of course, Charlie, said I. I don't know. Are you making fun of me? The current was broken for the time being. I took up a notebook and pretended to make many entries in it. It's a pleasure to work with an imaginative chap like yourself, I said after a pause. The way that you brought out the character of the hero is simply wonderful. Do you think so? He answered with a pleased blush. I often tell myself that there's more in me than my mother, than people think. There's an enormous amount in you. Then won't you let me send an essay on the ways of bank clerks to titbits and get the guinea prize? That wasn't exactly what I meant, old fellow. Perhaps it would be better to wait a little and go ahead with the galley story. Ah, but I shan't get the credit of that. Titbits would publish my name and address if I win. What are you grinning at? They would. I know it. Suppose you go for a walk. I want to look through my notes about our story. Now this reprehensible youth who left me, a little hurt and put back, might, for aught he or I knew, have been one of the crew of the Argo, had been certainly slave or comrade to Thorfinn Karlsvne. Therefore, he was deeply interested in guinea competitions. Remembering what Grish Chunder had said, I laughed aloud. The lords of life and death would never allow Charlie Mears to speak with full knowledge of his past, and I must even piece out what he had told me with my own poor inventions while Charlie wrote of the ways of bank clerks. 
I got together and placed on one file all my notes, and the net result was not cheering. I read them a second time. There was nothing that might not have been compiled at second hand from other people's books, except perhaps the story of the fight in the harbour. The adventures of a Viking had been written many times before. The history of a Greek galley slave was no new thing, and though I wrote both, who could challenge or confirm the accuracy of my details? I might as well tell a tale of two thousand years hence. The lords of life and death were as cunning as Greece Chunder had hinted. They would allow nothing to escape that might trouble or make easy the minds of men. Though I was convinced of this, yet I could not leave the tale alone. Exultation followed reaction not once but twenty times in the next few weeks. My moods varied with the March sunlight and flying clouds. By night, or in the beauty of a spring morning, I perceived that I could write that tale and shift continents thereby. In the wet, windy afternoons, I saw that the tale might indeed be written, but would be nothing more than a fake, false-varnished, sham-rusted piece of Wardour Street work at the end. Then I blessed Charlie in many ways, though it was no fault of his. He seemed to be busy with prize competitions, and I saw less and less of him as the weeks went by, and the earth cracked and grew ripe to spring, and the buds swelled in their sheets. He did not care to read or talk of what he had read, and there was a new ring of self-assertion in his voice. I hardly cared to remind him of the galley when we met, but Charlie alluded to it on every occasion, always as a story from which money was to be made. "'I think I deserve twenty-five per cent, don't I, at least?' he said, with beautiful frankness. "'I supplied all the ideas, didn't I?' This greediness for silver was a new side in his nature. I assume that it had been developed in the city, where Charlie was picking up the curious nasal drawl of the underbred city man. "'When the thing's done, we'll talk about it. I can't make anything of it at present. Red-haired or black-haired hero were equally difficult. He was sitting by the fire, staring at the red coals. "'I can't understand what you find so difficult. It's all as clean as mud to me,' he replied. A jet of gas puffed out between the bars, took light and whistled softly. "'Suppose we take the red-haired hero's adventures first, from the time that he came south to my galley and captured it and sailed to the beaches.' I knew better now than to interrupt Charlie. I was out of reach of pen and paper, and dared not move to get them, lest I should break the current. The gas jet puffed and whinnied. Charlie's voice dropped almost to a whisper and he told the tale of the sailing of an open galley to Fudustrandai, of sunsets on the open sea, seen under the curve of the one sail evening after evening, when the galley's beak was notched into the centre of the sinking disk. And we sailed by that, for we had no other guide, quoth Charlie. He spoke of a landing on an island, and explorations in its woods, where the crew killed three men, whom they found asleep under the pines. Their ghosts, Charlie said, followed the galley, swimming and choking in the water, and the crew cast lots and threw one of their number overboard as a sacrifice to the strange gods whom they had offended. Then they ate seaweed when their provisions failed, and their legs swelled, and their leader, the red-haired man, killed two rowers who mutinied, and after a year spent among the woods, they set sail for their own country, and a wind that never failed carried them back so safely that they all slept at night. This and much more Charlie told. Sometimes the voice fell so low that I could not catch the words, though every nerve was on the strain. He spoke of their leader, the red-haired man, as a pagan speaks of his god, for it was he who cheered them and slew them impartially as he thought best for their needs, and it was he who steered them for three days among floating ice, each floe crowded with strange beasts that tried to sail with us, said Charlie, and we beat them back with the handles of the oars. 
the gas jet went out, a burned coal gave way, and the fire settled down with a tiny crash to the bottom of the grate. Charlie ceased speaking, and I said no word. By Jove, he said at last, shaking his head, I've been staring at the fire till I'm dizzy. What was I going to say? Something about the galley. I remember now. It's twenty-five per cent of the profits, isn't it? It's anything you like when I've done the tale. I wanted to be sure of that. I must go now. I've... I've an appointment. And he left me. Had my eyes not been held, I might have known that that broken muttering over the fire was the swan song of Charlie Mears. But I thought it the prelude to fuller revelation. At last and at last I should cheat the lords of life and death. When next Charlie came to me, I received him with rapture. He was nervous and embarrassed, but his eyes were very full of light, and his lips a little parted. I've done a poem, he said, and then quickly. It's the best I've ever done. Read it. He thrust it into my hand and retreated to the window. I groaned inwardly. It would be the work of half an hour to criticise, that is to say, praise, the poem sufficiently to please Charlie. Then I had good reason to groan, for Charlie, discarding his favourite centipede metres, had launched into shorter and choppier verse, and verse with a motive at the back of it. This is what I read. The day is most fair, the cheery wind, Halloos behind the hill, where he bends the wood as seemeth good, and the sapling to his will. Riot, O oh wind, there is that in my blood that would not have thee still. She gave me herself, O oh earth, O oh sky, grey sea, she is mine alone. Let the sullen boulders hear my cry, and rejoice though they be but stone. Mine, I have won her, O oh good brown earth. Make merry, tis hard on spring. Make merry, my love, is doubly worth All worship your fields can bring. Let the bind that tills you feel my mirth At the early harrowing. Yes, it's the early harrowing, past a doubt, I said, With a dread at my heart. Charlie smiled, but did not answer. Red cloud of the sunset, tell it abroad. I am victor, greet me, O sun. Dominant master and absolute lord, Over the soul of one. Well, said Charlie, looking over my shoulder, I thought it far from well, and very evil indeed, When he silently laid a photograph on the paper, The photograph of a girl with a curly head, and a foolish slack mouth. Isn't it, isn't it wonderful? He whispered, pink to the tips of his ears, wrapped in the rosy mystery of first love. I didn't know, I didn't think. It came like a thunderclap. Yes, it comes like a thunderclap. Are you very happy, Charlie? My God, she, she loves me. He sat down, repeating the last words to himself. I looked at the hairless face, the narrow shoulders already bowed by desk work and wondered when, where, and how he had loved in his past lives. "'What will your mother say?' I asked, cheerfully. "'I don't care a damn what she says.' At twenty, the things for which one does not care a damn should properly be many, but one must not include mothers in the list. I told him this gently, and he described her even as Adam must have described to the newly named beasts the glory and tenderness and beauty of Eve. Incidentally, I learnt that she was a tobacconist's assistant with a weakness for pretty dress, and had told him four or five times already that she had never been kissed by a man before. Charlie spoke on and on and on, while I, separated from him by thousands of years, was considering the beginnings of things. Now I understood why the lords of life and death shut the door so carefully behind us. It is that we may not remember our first wooings. Were it not so, our world would be without inhabitants in a hundred years. 
Now, about that galley story, I said, still more cheerfully, in a pause in the rush of the speech. Charlie looked up as though he had been hit. The galley? What galley? Oh, good heavens, don't joke, man. This is serious. You don't know how serious it is. Grish Chunder was right. Charlie had tasted the love of woman that kills remembrance, and the finest story in the world would never be written. End of the Finest Story in the World by Rudyard Kipling Dickon the Devil by Joseph Sheridan Lofano This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tony Addison. Dickon the Devil by Joseph Sheridan Lafanu. About thirty years ago, I was selected by two rich old maids to visit a property in that part of Lancashire which lies near the famous forest of Pendle, with which Mr. Ainsworth's Lancashire Witches has made us so pleasantly familiar. My business was to make partition of a small property, including a house and demesne, to which they had a long time before succeeded as co-heiresses. The last forty miles of my journey I was obliged to post, chiefly by crossroads, little known and less frequented, and presenting scenery often extremely interesting and pretty. The picturesqueness of the landscape was enhanced by the season, the beginning of September, at which I was travelling. I had never been in this part of the world before. I am told it is now a great deal less wild, and, consequently, less beautiful. At the inn where I had stopped for a relay of horses and some dinner, for it was then past five o'clock, I found the host, a hale old fellow of five and sixty, as he told me, a man of easy and garrulous benevolence, willing to accommodate his guests with any amount of talk, which the slightest tap sufficed to set flowing on any subject you please. I was curious to learn something about Barwick, which was the name of the demesne and house I was going to. As there was no inn within some miles of it, I had written to the steward to put me up there the best way he could for a night. The host of the three nuns, which was the sign under which he entertained wayfarers, had not a great deal to tell. It was twenty years or more since old Squire Bowes died, and no one had lived in the hall ever since, except the gardener and his wife. Tom Windsor will be as old a man as myself, but he's a bit taller, not so much in flesh quite, said the fat innkeeper. But there were stories about the house, I repeated, that they said prevented tenants from coming into it. Old oh, wives' tales, oh, many years ago that will be, sir, I forget em. I forget em all. Ah, oh, yes, there always will be when a house is left so. Foolish folk will always be talking, but I hadn't heard a word about it this twenty years. It was vain trying to pump him. The old landlord of the three nuns, for some reason, did not choose to tell tales of Barwick Hall, if he really did, as I suspected, remember them. I paid my reckoning, and resumed my journey, well pleased with the good cheer of that old world inn, but a little disappointed. We had been driving for more than an hour, when we began to cross a wild common, and I knew that this passed a quarter of an hour would bring me to the door of Barrack Hall. The peat and firs were pretty soon left behind. We were again in the wooded scenery that I enjoyed so much, so entirely natural and pretty, 
and so little disturbed by traffic of any kind. I was looking from the chaise window, and soon detected the object of which for some time my eye had been in search. A barrack hall was a large quaint house of that cage-work fashion known as black and white, in which the bars and angles of an oak framework contrast black as ebony with the white plaster that overspreads the masonry built into its interstices. This steep-roofed Elizabethan house stood in the midst of park-like grounds of no great extent, but rendered imposing by the noble stature of the old trees that now cast their lengthening shadows eastward over the sward from the declining sun. The park wall was grey with age, and in many places laden with ivy. In deep grey shadow, that contrasted with the dim fires of evening reflected on the foliage above it, in a gentle hollow, stretched a lake that looked cold and black, and seemed, as it were, to skulk from observation with a guilty knowledge. I had forgot that there was a lake at Barrack, but the moment this caught my eye like the cold polish of a snake in the shadow, my instinct seemed to recognise something dangerous, and I knew that the lake was connected, I could not remember how, with the story I had heard of this place in my boyhood. I drove up a grass-grown avenue under the boughs of these noble trees, whose foliage, dyed in autumnal red and yellow, returned the beams of the western sun gorgeously. We drew up at the door. I got out, and had a good look at the front of the house. It was a large and melancholy mansion, with signs of long neglect upon it. Great wooden shutters in the old fashion were barred outside across the windows. Grass and even nettles were growing thick on the courtyard, and a thin moss streaked the timber beams. The plaster was discoloured by time and weather, and bore great russet and yellow stains. The gloom was increased by several grand old trees that crowded close about the house. I mounted the steps, and looked round. The dark lake lay near me now, a little to the left. It was not large. It may have covered some ten or twelve acres, but it added to the melancholy of the scene. Near the centre of it was a small island, with two old ash-trees leaning toward each other, their pensive images reflected in the stirless water. The only cheery influence in this scene of antiquity, solitude, and neglect was that the house and landscape were warmed with the ruddy western beams. I knocked, and my summons resounded hollow and ungenial in my ear, and the bell from far away returned a deep-mouthed and surly ring, as if it resented being roused from a score years' slumber. A light-limbed, jolly-looking old fellow, in a barracan jacket and gaiters, with a smile of welcome, and a very sharp red nose that seemed to promise good cheer, opened the door with a promptitude that indicated a hospitable expectation of my arrival. There was but little light in the hall, and that little lost itself in darkness in the background. It was very spacious and lofty, with a gallery running round it, which, when the door was open, was visible at two or three points. Almost in the dark, my new acquaintance led me across this wide hall into the room destined for my reception. It was spacious, and wainscoted up to the ceiling. The furniture of this capacious chamber was old-fashioned and clumsy. There were curtains still to the windows, and a piece of turkey carpet lay upon the floor. Those windows were two in number, looking out through the trunks of the trees close to the house upon the lake. 
it needed all the fire and all the pleasant associations of my entertainer's red nose to light up this melancholy chamber a door at its farther end admitted to the room that was prepared for my sleeping apartment it was wainscoted like the other it had a four-post bed with heavy tapestry curtains and in other respects was furnished in the same old world and ponderous style as the other room its window like those of that apartment looked out upon the lake sombre and sad as these rooms were they were yet scrupulously clean i had nothing to complain of but the effect was rather dispiriting having given some directions about supper a pleasant incident to look forward to and made a rapid toilette i called on my friend with the gaiters and red nose tom windsor whose occupation was that of a bailiff or under steward of the property to accompany me as we had still an hour or so of sun and twilight in a walk over the grounds it was a sweet autumn evening and my guide a hardy old fellow strode at a pace that tasked me to keep up with among clumps of trees at the northern boundary of the demesne we lighted upon the little antique parish church i was looking down upon it from an eminence and the park wall interposed but a little way down was a stile affording access to the road and by this we approached the iron gate of the churchyard i saw the church door open the sexton was replacing his pick shovel and spade with which he had just been digging a grave in the churchyard in their little repository under the stone stair of the tower he was a polite shrewd little hunchback who was very happy to show me over the church among the monuments was one that interested me it was erected to commemorate the very squire bowes from whom my two old maids had inherited the house and estate of barrack it spoke of him in terms of grandiloquent eulogy and informed the christian reader that he had died in the bosom of the church of england at the age of seventy-one i read this inscription by the parting beams of the setting sun which disappeared behind the horizon just as we passed out from under the porch twenty years since the squire died said i reflecting as i loitered still in the churchyard ay sir twill be twenty year the ninth o last month and a very good old gentleman good-natured enough and an easy gentleman he was sir i don't think while he lived he ever heard to fly acquiesced tom windsor it ain't always easy saying what's in em though and what they may take or turn to afterwards and some of them sort i think goes mad you don't think he was out of his mind i asked he ho oh, la no not he sir a bit lazy mayhap like other old fellows ah oh, but a knew devilish well what he was about tom winsar's account was a little enigmatical but like old squire bowes i was a bit lazy that evening and asked no more questions about him we got over the stile upon the narrow road that skirts the churchyard it is overhung by elms more than a hundred years old and in the twilight which now prevailed was growing very dark as side by side we walked along this road hemmed in by two loose stone-like walls something running towards us in a zigzag line passed us at a wild pace with a sound like a frightened laugh or a shudder and i saw as it passed that it was a human figure i may confess now that i was a little startled the dress of this figure was in part white i know i mistook it at first for a white horse coming down the road at a gallop tom winsard turned about 
and looked after the retreating figure. "'He'll be on his troubles to-night,' he said in a low tone. "'Easy served with a bed that lad be. Six foot a dry peat or heat, or a nook in a dry ditch. "'That lad hasn't slept once in a house this twenty year, "'and never will while grass grows.' "'Is he mad?' I asked. "'Something that way, sir. He's an idiot, an orpy. "'We call him Dickon the Devil, "'because the devil's almost the only word that's ever in his mouth.' "'It struck me that this idiot was in some way connected "'with the story of old Squire Bowes. "'Queer things are told of him, I dare say,' I suggested. "'More or less, sir, more or less. "'Queer stories, some.' Twenty years since he slept in a house. That's about the time the squire died, I continued. So it will be, sir, and not very long after. You must tell me all about that, Tom, tonight, when I can hear it comfortably after supper. Tom did not seem to like my invitation, and looking straight before him as we trudged on, he said, You see, sir, the house has been quiet, and now it's been troubling folk inside the walls or out, all round the woods of Barrack this ten year or more, and my old woman down there is clear against talking about such matters, and thinks it best, and so do I, to let sleeping dogs be. He dropped his voice towards the close of the sentence and nodded significantly. We soon reached a point where he unlocked a wicket in the park wall, by which we entered the grounds of Barrack once more. The twilight deepening over the landscape, the huge and solemn trees, and the distant outline of the haunted house exercised a sombre influence on me, which, together with the fatigue of a day of travel, and the brisk walk we had had disinclined me to interrupt the silence in which my companion now indulged. A certain air of comparative comfort on our arrival in great measure dissipated the gloom that was stealing over me. Although it was by no means a cold night, I was very glad to see some wood blazing in the grate, and a pair of candles aiding the light of the fire made the room look cheerful. A small table, with a very white cloth, and preparations for supper, was also a very agreeable object. I should have liked very well, under these influences, to have listened to Tom Winsour's story, but after supper I grew too sleepy to attempt to lead him to the subject, and after yawning for a time, I found there was no use in contending against my drowsiness, so I betook myself to my bedroom, and by ten o'clock was fast asleep. What interruption I experienced that night, I shall tell you presently. It was not much, but it was very odd. By next night I had completed my work at Barrack. From early morning till then, I was so incessantly occupied and hard work that I had not time to think over the singular occurrence to which I have just referred. Behold me, however, at length, once more seated at my little supper-table, having ended a comfortable meal. It had been a sultry day, and I had thrown one of the large windows up as high as it would go. I was sitting near it, with my brandy and water at my elbow, looking out into the dark. There was no moon, and the trees that are grouped about the house make the darkness round it supernaturally profound on such nights. A Tom, said I, so soon as the jug of hot punch I had supplied him with began to exercise its genial and communicative influence, you must tell me who, beside your wife and you and myself, slept in the house last night. Tom, sitting near the door, set down his tumbler, and looked at me askance, 
while you might count seven, without speaking a word. Who else slept in the house? he repeated, very deliberately. Not a living soul, sir. And he looked hard at me, still evidently expecting something more. That is very odd, I said, returning his stare, and feeling really a little odd. You are sure you were not in my room last night? Not till I came to call you, sir, this morning. I can make oath of that. Well, said I, there was someone there. I can make oath of that. I was so tired, I could not make up my mind to get up. But I was waked by a sound that I thought was someone flinging down the two tin boxes in which my papers were locked up violently on the floor. I heard a slow step on the ground, and there was light in the room. Although I remembered having put out my candle, I thought it must have been you who had come in for my clothes and upset the boxes by accident. Whoever it was, he went out, and the light with him. I was about to settle again, when the curtain, being a little open at the foot of the bed, I saw a light on the wall opposite, such as a candle from outside would cast, if the door were very cautiously opening. I started up in the bed, drew the side curtain, and saw that the door was opening, and admitting light from outside. It is close, you know, to the head of the bed. A hand was holding on the edge of the door, and pushing it open, and not a bit like yours, a very singular hand. Let me look at yours. He extended it for my inspection. Oh, no, there's nothing wrong with your hand. This was differently shaped, fatter, and the middle finger was stunted and shorter than the rest, looking as if it had once been broken, and the nail was crooked like a claw. I called out, who's there? And the light and the hand were withdrawn, and I saw and heard no more of my visitor. So sure as you're a living man, that was him! exclaimed Tom Winsar, his very nose growing pale, and his eyes almost starting out of his head. Who? I asked. Old Squire Bowes, twas his hand you saw, the Lord of mercy on us, answered Tom. The broken finger and the nail bent like a hoop. Oh, well for you, sir, he didn't come back when you called that time. You came here about them Miss Dimmock's business, and he never meant they should have a foot of ground in Barrack, and he was making a will to give it away quite different when death took him short. He never was uncivil to no one, but he couldn't abide them ladies. My mind misgave me when I heard twas about their business you were coming, and now you see how it is. He'll be at his old tricks again. With some pressure and a little more punch, I induced Tom Winsor to explain his mysterious allusions by recounting the occurrences which followed the old squire's death. Squire Bowes of Barrack died without making a will, as you know, said Tom, and all the folk round were sorry, that is to say, sir, as sorry as folk will be for an old man that has seen a long tale of years, and has no right to grumble that death has knocked an hour too soon at his door. The squire was well liked. He was never in a passion or said a hard word, and he would not hurt a fly, and that made what happened after his decease the more surprising. The first thing these ladies did when they got the property was to buy stock for the park, it was not wise in any case to graze the land on their own account, but they little knew all they had to contend with. Before long, something went wrong with the cattle. First one and then another took sick and died, and so on, till the loss began to grow heavy. Then queer stories, little by little, began to be told. It was said, first by one, then by another, that Squire Bowes was seen about evening time, walking just as he used to do when he was alive among the old trees, leaning on his stick, and sometimes when he came up with the cattle he would stop and lay his hand kindly-like on the back of one of them, and that one was sure to fall sick next day and die soon after. No one ever met him in the park or in the woods, 
or ever saw him except a good distance off but they knew his gait and his figure well and the clothes he used to wear and they could tell the beast he laid his hand on by its colour white done or black and that beast was sure to sicken and die the neighbours grew shy of taking the path over the park and no one liked to walk in the woods or come inside the bounds of barrack and the cattle went on sickening and dying as before at that time there was one thomas pike he had been a groom to the old squire and he was in care of the place and was the only one that used to sleep in the house tom was vexed hearing these stories which he did not believe the harp on em and more especial as he could not get man or boy to herd the cattle all being afeard so he wrote to matlock in derbyshire for his brother richard pike a clever lad and one that knew now of the story of the old squire walking dick came and the cattle was better folks said they could still see the old squire sometimes walking as before in openings of the wood with his stick in his hand but he was shy of coming nigh the cattle whatever his reason might be since dick and pike came and he used to stand a long bit off looking at them with no more stir in him than a trunk of one of the old trees for an hour at a time till the shape melted away little by little like the smoke of a fire that burns out tom pike and his brother dickon being the only living souls in the house lay in the big bed in the servants room the house being fast barred and locked one night in november tom was lying next the wall and he told me as wide awake as ever he was at noonday his brother dickon lay outside and was sound asleep well as tom lay thinking with his eyes turned toward the door it opened slowly and who should come in but old squire bowes his face looking as dead as he was in his coffin tom's very breath left his body he could not take his eyes off him and he felt the hair rising up on his head the squire came to the side of the bed and put his arms under dickon and lifted the boy in a dead sleep all the time and carried him out so at the door such was the appearance to tom pike's eyes and he was ready to swear to it anywhere when this happened the light wherever it came from all on a sudden went out and tom could not see his own hand before him more dead than alive he lay till daylight sure enough his brother dickon was gone no sign of him could he discover about the house and with some trouble he got a couple of the neighbours to help him to search the woods and grounds not a sign of him anywhere at last one of them thought of the island in the lake the little boat was moored to the old post at the water's edge in they got though with small hope of finding him there find him nevertheless they did sitting under the big ash tree quite out of his wits and to all their questions he answered nothing but one cry bows the devil see him see him bows the devil an idiot they found him and so he will be till god sets all things right no one could ever get him to sleep under roof tree more he wanders from house to house while daylight lasts and no one cares to lock the harmless creature in the workhouse and folk would rather not meet him after nightfall for they think where he is there may be worse things near a silence followed tom's story he and i were alone in that large room i was sitting near the open window looking into the dark night air i fancied i saw something white move across it and i heard a sound like low talking that swelled into a discordant shriek who bows the devil over your shoulder hoo, 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 ha, ha, ha. i started up and saw by the light of the candle with which tom strode to the window the wild eyes and blighted face of the idiot as with a sudden change of mood he drew off whispering and tittering to himself and holding up his long fingers and looking at the tips like a hand of glory tom pulled down the window 
the story and its epilogue were over. I confess I was rather glad when I heard the sound of the horse's hoofs on the courtyard a few minutes later, and still gladder when, having bidden Tom a kind farewell, I had left the neglected house of Barrack a mile behind me. End of Dickon the Devil